because I've heard that. And yeah. then my question is, then why doesn't every pregnant woman have cancer? Because they're exactly. releasing tons of estrogen. So help me with that. Because endogenous application, so what your own body makes is not the problem. Mm. It's how it's metabolized or how it gets jammed up or convoluted because of other exogenous information. Too much stress, too many carbs, you know, too many toxins in the environment. That's where what nature intended goes awry. Today on Midlife Conversations, I've got Dr. Nasha Winters, and I've been so looking forward to this conversation. She wrote the book called The Metabolic Approach to Cancer, which by the way, it's not just for you if you have cancer. This is for everybody. I was gifted this book and I could not put it down. I think I'm an encyclopedia for this book now. I've now officially read it or listened to it five times. Because of Dr. Nisha Winters, I have changed so much of my life, so much I've added in. I've changed out my products. It, it's so incredible. So I can't wait to have her on today. Uh, thank you so much for being here. I can't wait to dive in and have a conversation with you. I love it. I love it. I love it. I love, I love getting to be um, in front of new people. I love getting to be in front of new audiences. And I really love your, what you were sharing with me before we started recording about just like, this is, this is like a handbook of how to live well on an unhealthy planet. And I really appreciate that you yourself realize you do not have to have nor wait for Yes. A cancer diagnosis to start having these conversations. No, this is really what, honored. what you teach is so relevant for all of us. I think it's going to help people reduce their biological age. It's going to help people thrive in midlife. There's, there's so many benefits to this and to avoid just all disease actually in general, like type two diabetes, there's so much that you teach. And then one thing I, we're going to address on this episode today, I'm just preparing everyone. Now I've had a lot <laughs> of guests on about hormones and she has a different view on it. So I want to talk about that view too. This is important, especially those of you that, you know, have been questioning, like your doctor said one thing and you're hearing another, we're going to look at the other side, then maybe the negatives of why we don't want to do hormones. We're going to look at that too. So mm-hmm. I, gosh, I don't even know where to start, but I'm just going to dive in. Let's, let's start with why did you even get interested in the metabolic approach to cancer? Like, where did that even come from? Sure. Well, it's, you know, I think anybody in the field of cancer in general, none of us really chose this as a vocation. It sort of chose us, right? So uh, personal life stories, people that you care about being touched by cancer today. I mean, gosh, 30 years ago or 25 years ago, I'd stand up in front of a room of people and say, how many of you here have been touched by cancer? And maybe a dozen hands would go up in a room of a couple hundred people. Today, I've had to reframe that question to say, how many of you have not been directly touched by cancer? And now you might get a couple of hands go up in the room. So that's within a 25 year span of differences. So we're all touched by this. My own story, I was actually, I love that I'm talking to like a woman about women's health things too here, Mm -hmm. because I had no good health. Although I lived with it for so long, it was insidious. I just assumed that all women had PCOS, endometriosis, Mm -hmm. thyroid dysfunction, rheumatoid arthritis, IBS. Those were the collection of diseases I had all before the age of 19. Wow. By, yeah. By the time I was a sophomore in college, summer before my sophomore in college, I was ending up in and out of the ER every single month with unbelievable pain. I was put on antibiotics for UTIs, and then I'd be put on antifungals for the yeast infections that co- I mean, it was just the nightmare. Right. And then they yeah. started trying to put me on anxiolytics because they just thought I was a histrionic, you know, teenager. And, and it was like, I just, it was dismissed, dismissed, dismissed. And I kept saying something's really wrong. And they all thought it was just more content, you know, continuation of the same patterns I'd had previously. Uh, that went on until I landed in the ER a couple weeks shy of my 20th birthday when my roommate basically found me unresponsive, um, massive swelling in my belly, really uh, malnourished. By the time I got to the hospital, my oxygen levels were in the seventies. Um, I had a mass, uh, a massive, they finally sent me in for imaging. They had a mass in my right ovary, the size of a grapefruit. They found oh. me my liver, peritoneal implants, carcinomatosis, which are, and you were not even 20. Oh my gosh. Just shy of that. And they're like, Oh, sh- sh- sheesh, you know, like this, this is not more of yeah. the same. This is a whole nother animal. They were so shocked by what was going on, as of course was I, um, that they said, unfortunately, there's nothing we can do. Your organs are failing. My kidneys were shut down. My liver was shut down. I had fluid in my abdomen. I had fluid in my um, lungs. I had fluid around my heart. And they basically yeah. triaged me, got me safe enough to say, go home and die. And so that was 31 and a half years ago. Right. And so that experience, I did not expect to live. That was not what I set out to do. I just, and especially honestly, Natalie, to be really frank with you and your audience, 
I'd actually tried to take my life a few times before that come from, you know, kind of a, a crazy background, which I also understand how that contributes to our health and well-being. But fast forward, what that moment did for me, what it continues to do for me is it lit a pilot light. And it basically said, why me? Or basically, why not me? Because that's really the question of today. And so that's what has put me on this 30 plus year journey of studying every single thing I can about why we get sick, mm. why um, we all can have cancer or not have cancer expressing in our bodies how to determine what to do about it for each of us individually. But more importantly, the only cure for cancer is actual prevention. Mm. Once we, I mean, we all have cancer cells all the time. So yes. once it's up and running, it's sort of up to us to maintain it. Um, so how about we have the conversations prior to even needing to contain it? Okay. So I've got a lot of questions here and I want to dive into prevention, but before I do that on prevention, if somebody's listening right now and they have cancer, they have a diagnosis, like regardless of stage, they're stage two, they're early, they're stage four. What do you want them to know before we dive into this conversation? Oh, so good. Well, first of all, please know that you are far more powerful than you've been led to believe. Okay. You have a much bigger hand and role in what the outcomes are than you've been led to believe, whether you're stage one or stage four. Mm -hmm. All right. There is absolutely no reason why a stage four person cannot live well with cancer for a very long time and die of something completely different. In fact, that's probably the biggest paradigm shift I would like to drop into the center of this okay. discussion today, being someone who would never standard of care would probably not qualify mm -hmm. me as no evidence of disease all these years later. And yet here I am thriving into my fifties with um, better health now than I had in my teens and twenties and thirties and forties. And so I want you to know that there's, there's choices, there's things to do along with standard of care. There's things to do instead of standard of care when standard of care is no more choices or options for you. Mm -hmm. And there's certainly things to do when you're in the survivorship area, when you've maybe gone through standard of care and now you're like, I don't ever want to do that rodeo again. There's things you can do at that time as well. So please know you have options that may not be offered to you in a lot of, of the medical environments that you've already, you know, okay. gone through. Okay. Now, if someone's hearing that and they are in the thick of traditional, um, like their chemo, their radiation, they're, they're in the trick of thick of treatment, can they apply what we are going to be sharing today alongside with that? 100%. In fact, I, I, I still don't understand with all of the decades I've been at this, why what you and I are talking about today is not standard of care. Yeah. There is no need to make a decision between the two. We've evolved to a place and our medical technologies and our medical understanding has evolved to a place to recognize there is room at the table for both the best of what standard of care has to offer, plus the best of vetted, for lack of better words, alternative therapies. Okay. Um, and so there's no reason to shun one or the other. The, the, the biggest difference is that you have also the ability to know exactly what you need at any given time. Mm -hmm. That might be a repurposed standard of care drug. That might be a lower dose of chemotherapy. That might be that you've already exhausted all of that standard of care has to offer. And now it's time to look elsewhere. It doesn't matter where you are. There are always options until you basically take okay. the last breath. Okay. <laughs> Let's talk prevention and what creates cancer to grow. And again, we're teaching this from your perspective, your research. Okay. What, so if you are listening right now and you have a different view, I'm just going to encourage you just to have an open mind. It's just, we, the more information we have, the better choices we can make for ourselves. I, even myself, um, as I was reading the book, there were a few things I was like super triggered. I'm like, wait, I don't agree with that. Doesn't align <laughs> with what I know, Good. Good. you know, but, um, I reminded myself as I'm reminding you listening, we can't evolve and get better if we don't keep an open mind and learn. And even if you don't agree with something, take it on, consider it. And it, there's, there's no reason not to try things on. So, so I, I wanted to kind of put that out there. So let's talk from your perspective, what creates cancer to grow? Perfect. So again, you know, 19, 20 year old, why, why, like, it, it, especially remember back in the early 1990, 91, 92, first of all, there was no Dr. Google. All right. We yeah. did not have the resources. We did not have access to the things we have today. We did not even know the things about cancer that we know today. So please have context around all of this. The other thing is even this book that we're discussing today came out in May of 2017. I could literally double the content of this book today from the research that's come out. 
there is literally nothing that has been completely negated outside of the fact that on page 191, we said, maybe this is not, maybe a, a ketogenic diet is not a good idea for prostate mm-hmm. cancer. Mm-hmm. Beyond that, that's probably the only thing I would actually change. Oh, that and Brazil nuts, but we'll come back to that. Okay. So, oh yeah. I need to know about Brazil nuts because I started cool. adding them. So. Oh, great. <laughs> okay. so, good. so these are like two things that might have, have a different conversation, but ultimately the rest of it has been, is quite, um, robust, right? Okay. It, it st- stood the, t- the test of times and it's actually had more data backing it. Um, I'm a data-driven person. So whatever is said in this book is yes, there's clinical uh, um, experience and clinical opinion, personal opinion, mm-hmm. but I'm also really uh, fastidious around referencing resourcing. So the book has almost 300 plus references. So go, go sure. have an AJ. And there's so many more to add to that since then. So back it up. What is cancer? We've been taught since 1914 that cancer is a genetic disorder, that it's a somatic mutation theory that was brought to light in 1914 by Dr. Theodore Bovary. That's how we've all been thinking about cancer and applying our, our research and applying our treatments to cancer ever since. We, we really hoped that when we um, you know, exposed the genome, that we'd find the secret sauce of how to prevent and treat cancer. Unfortunately, we didn't. So in 1920s, early 1920s, there was another scientist who started recognizing some things he was seeing in the lab that, uh, you know, in in Petri dishes and in cancer cells and in in people with cancer, that there was a change in metabolic activity, that there was a change in the mitochondrial both number, function, effective, you know, effectiveness, et cetera. And he started to explore this. This guy was Dr. Otto Warburg. A little bit of a controversial figure even today when we talk about him, but he stumbled upon something, which Mm -hmm. was that cancer cells had deranged metabolism, had deranged mitochondria. And it was at that level that we created vulnerabilities in our DNA, in our genetics that then could be switched into cancer, but it was much more than just genetics too. Mm -hmm. It was like the backing up. It's like, okay, Dr. Bovary was onto something, but there was actually a step before the genetics expressed in that way. That theory, actually, the, so the uh, metabolic theory of cancer and cancer as a metabolic disorder actually held pretty steady and strong and even outpaced the genetic theory until the 1950s, 1960s, when Watson and Crick of DNA Helix fame had their research come to bear and everyone kind of jumped back into the DNA boat and away we went. So we've started to build upon the ideas and the concepts of Dr. Um, uh, Otto Warburg since the 1980s. People like Dr. Mina Bissell, badass cancer researcher, 40 years at this showing that it's not the cancer cell or the tumor itself that's the problem. It's what the milieu is that that tumor or tumor cell is lying in. Others have talked about it as the extracellular matrix. Others have talked about it as the terrain. That's how I describe it. But we've really started to understand that cancer is much more complex than just a genetic disorder. And so when I look at what made that mitochondria shift, what made that metabolic shift happen that then led to vulnerable DNA, That's when I started to, in my own career and my own pattern recognition and gathering tens of thousands of of patients data, started to look at about 10 major drivers or things that could flip the switch from a non-cancering to a cancering process. And I'll kind of briefly go down the corner. So epigenetics is one and epigenetics is what's been handed down to you from previous generations. Now that is not set in stone those genes. Those are genes that we, that's epi means above the gene, which also means you can overcome that expression and 90 to 95%, depending on the research you're looking at of all of our chronic illnesses, including cancer are epigenetically driven, meaning we have the control to change its expression genetically driven diseases that are just like, these are fast and furious. These are st- you know stagnant, hard to change that, that constitutes less than five to 10% of all diseases, especially cancer. So if so- someone says like, I have breast cancer in my family, or I have pancreatic cancer, I have this thing you're saying that you, that is part of it, but it's how, what's turning that on. That's the bigger mm-hmm. issue nailing it. That is exactly it. And so we know we've got those propensities, those predispositions that you just spoke to, but the other nine drops in that bucket are what express that or suppress that. Right. Those other drops include our metabolic health. So specifically, how are we feeding and fueling ourselves? And so the way even Western medicine defines metabolic health is without pharmaceutical intervention, Mm -hmm. are you able to achieve a good blood pressure 
120 over 80 ish. Are you able to achieve a good blood sugar? They qualified as under a hundred. That's too, too much. It needs to be right. under 85 for that. Under 85 consistently all day long. Yeah. Like yeah. really well, all a, day? Okay. a 20%, a 20 point change. After okay. So okay. It got it higher, but fasted, um, a body fat composition under 25%. Okay. okay. So that's so, so whether you are body fat, like externally looking heavy or yeah. internally, uh, as I, I discussed on a podcast this morning, it's almost like fat wrapped around your organs. So you might be toffee thin on the outside fat, so on like the, the visceral inside. fat. Yes, exactly. It's like, basically you're like bacon wrapped organs, right? So yes. you need to, to be a, a qualifying for that. You also need to be conditioned, meaning can you comfortably go for a really, you know, good, like, can you do a 10 minute mile type of thing? There's that piece. And then, um, you know, the other component is your waist to hip ratio. So okay. your, your BMI volume. or your, okay. exactly. And a little bit, okay. because even then you can have a, you can have a low or a high BMI, but you can still have your hips wider than your yes. face, right? So we want to look at those. Those are some and of them. And you said without pharmaceutical intervention. Exactly. So if I'm hearing correctly, so that's not, if you're on metformin, that's not, if you're on blood pressure medicine, this is like, if your lifestyle is allowing for these things. Nail it. it. And that's where they, and then that you just remind me, the other one is to have a good lipid profile. Now okay. your lipid range and mine differ because yes, for a variety of reasons, we can go on that topic at another time, but basically without, you know, having good triglycerides under 90 and HDL, your good cholesterol mm-hmm. over 70 is ideal. And so without so everyone listening, don't panic now. If you're like, okay, two of those things are off. Like I'll, I'll just own mine. I mean, mine yeah. and I eat really, really healthy and yeah. clean. My lipid profile is not good. My triglycerides are good. My lipid profile has been off genetically my whole life. And I've created a story around that. Love it. Um, and my blood sugar eating the way that I was until I actually started going keto, like really concentrating on keto, my blood sugar after eating was going all the way up to 200 just from having like, just from having like an apple. Yeah. So, so I want people listening to also hear that because I'm someone who doesn't fit. Like I don't have the body fat or the, the BMI. I don't have, I look like the profile. And so I would have been that person that I have the genetic marker and I would have said, oh, it's genetics, but I wasn't looking at all of these variables that are so critical. So this is really good. So if you're listening, don't panic. If you have things, I'm telling you, I'm learning too. So this is good. <laughs> so. And the cool thing is they're all things that we can change. They're all yes. figure outable, you know, that, that statement out there. And the interesting thing, that's just the metabolic drop in the bucket. And just so you and your listeners know, not only are you struggling with two of those five or six things, 93% of the population Wow. Keep that 93% of the population, actually 93.7%. Actually, my, it, it's That's either 93.7 yeah. or 93.3, uh, but basically less than 7% of us in the Western world and specifically in the United States are considered metabolically healthy. That's crazy. That right there should be a ding, 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 ding. It's a huge ding, ding, ding. So, so that you said there's 10 drivers. That's just one of them, but this is a huge issue. Yes, exactly. And so that one takes the literal and pun intended cake (laughs) of that piece. Then we follow it with toxins. Like it's no longer a matter of if you're toxic, it's you are, and how bad is it? And how does it interplay with your metabolic health and your epigenetics? Then we look at your microbiome just a couple of years ago, everyone pretended it didn't exist. No, that's important. Today it's all the hot topic, right? Yeah. And then we look at immune system. Um, if you've been living under a rock the last few years, uh, you probably realize that our immune systems are not working well. Then we talk about inflammation. We're known as the inflammation era. Then we talk about angiogenesis, um, which specific to cancer, which is new blood vessel growth to tumors, but more particular in both prevention and treatment is oxygenation and perfusion. Like how well are you perfusing? And then we look at hormone modulation. That's the key word here. We're going to come back to that in a moment about hormone okay. modulation and then stress stress response and circadian rhythm is another drop in the bucket. Wow. And the final big drop is the mental emotional component. And so those 10 drops, epigenetics, metabolic toxin, microbiome, immune system, inflammation, inflammation oxygenation, hormone health and balance, a certain, you know, stress and circadian rhythm and mental emotional are the 10 drops. Wow. And I have people tell me I was healthy until I got cancer. I always Mm -hmm. remind them that was literally impossible. Yes. And what I'm also seeing you listing these out here 
is that one of these things, if not addressed, will create the other problems. So like microbiome can create your metabolic issue, which then creates stress or sleep. So it's like, so it seems to me that it's worth like really diving into each of these things or like toxins. You think it just, even your house has mold, let's say you're going to create a whole chain of events. So that's why they're all actually important because one thing will spin the others out of control. I would imagine. You are, oh, Natalie, perfect. That is exactly spot on, that none of these happen in a vacuum and that there's usually a blind spot or two or 10 in mm -hmm. some situations. And at the beginning of the book, we have a little questionnaire. In fact, we have an updated version of that since the five-year mark of the book. Uh, my co-author and I updated our questionnaires on our websites and whatnot. But what you will find is that you can go through, even what's in the book right now, go through, do the terrain 10 questionnaire, to understand those 10 different drops in the bucket with 10 basic questions and see which of those you score the highest in. When you see maybe your top one to three, that's where you might go dive in and just read those chapters and yes. see what blind spots you had and start the journey of self-awareness, of curiosity, exploration, and changing things out very slowly. And, you know, and, and to your, to your mm -hmm. point, Natalie, you started us off today saying I've made so many changes in my household. Yes. From this. Well, most people won't do that overnight. So looking at your priorities and starting to tackle them one at a time. And I was full cold Turkey. I'm an A plus student. I was like, <laughs> everything goes, <laughs> like, everything goes. Awesome. Good yeah, it was, it was actually pretty funny. And then what I, what I also loved is especially just looking at one of the big things that came up with me around keto was, well, I don't want to not have, you know, this whole variety of vegetables, but what I learned from her was like, it's not just vegetables, it's herbs. It's spice. like, there's so many ways to create this healthy gut biome that, that can change things for you. So I want to dive into some of these like very specific topics, if you're okay with it. Like I want to dive into metabolic health since that seems to be the biggest problem. And I want to explain keto from your perspective and like what actually, so for instance, like, so I can't say that I'm extreme keto, like I'm not exact, but I've been very good about being under a certain amount of carbs and being there. I'm not testing myself for ketones. So let's yeah. start with that. Like how important it is it for you to actually be in ketosis versus just eating a really low processed food, like very like low carb diet. Perfect. Well, a little back background information on this. First of all, we are all born in ketosis or should be right. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's designed. So we actually survive. Right? Mm -hmm. So, um, we also naturally, uh, go in or historically for tens of thousands of years, we're in ketosis for part times of the year because food scarcity, what was available and what was not available. So we were so perfectly divinely created to be able to utilize burning of fat or burning of sugar as the resources were available up until the 1850s. We were all, at least in the West, constant in West meaning European, you know, most, most parts of the planet were very pr before 1850 low carb, what we would call low carb today. Okay. Because we were eating seasonally, we were eating locally and we were working very hard for those carbs. Right. And so we had to put a lot of energy out to get that energy in. Mm. Until we hit the industrial food revolution in the 1850s, we then started to mill sugar and flour. We started to have, you know, into the early 19th, like refrigeration. We started to be able to transport things. We started to be able to eat a little bit differently than we'd ever eaten in our human humanity. Sure. And so we went from an average of five pounds of sugar per person per year in 1850 to 145 to 175, wow. depending on the research today, today right? Wow. That's a big change. And what's really a short period of time in human evolution. So that started to throw things off that started to create a lot of the processes we're talking about today. We die of metabolic diseases today, cardiovascular disease, diabetes, obesity, um, cancer, dementia, Alzheimer's in particular, it's actually known as diet type three diabetes today. So these are the things that plague us today. And that's thanks to that metabolic instability that I rattled off earlier, where less than 7% of us are actually metabolically yeah. healthy. So that's a big one right there. So maybe that's where we take a breath and see if there's anything to unpack okay. before we move into the next piece. Yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense. So let's, so that being said, what, what some people hear is just eliminate sugar. So I used to think that too, like just, right. oh, I'll just take out processed sugar, but right. like fruit is great. Or I'll just take out, you know, I'll just include whole grains as long as they're gluten-free. And what I don't, I didn't connect the dots that what we are taught is healthy. And I'm a, a sports nutritionist, like <laughs> I'm educated on this. What we are taught is healthy doesn't translate necessarily to metabolic health, because for instance, like if, if a sweet potato or an apple is spiking your blood sugar, 
you might think you're eating healthy, but we're creating a metabolic problem. Nailed so, it. so what you're saying to me makes total sense. Somebody listening might be catching up on that right now, but I want to explain now, like, how do you advise people eat for metabolic sure. health? And most importantly, when people hear keto, they automatically think high protein, high right. fat, no uh, carbs, right? That's what right. they go to. Right. And then how do we, so how is that the right way to do it to make your lipid profile say, okay. Perfect. Okay. So two things here. First of all, you can't know how well you're doing with your blood sugar unless you test, right? So you really can't know. So test, assess, address, don't guess is my mantra. Okay. And so with that, you can do simple things like your basic, like a, a glucose blood test that you do at your annual physical really means nothing. It's a snapshot no. in time. It's very variable. You could have worked out. By that. the way, mine was normal y'all. So that's how I didn't know until I had a monitor on. Yeah. Right. Think exactly. So this is what's perfect. It's like, you can kind of fudge your fasting glucose. If you had a workout, you fasted a little bit longer. You cannot so easily fudge something known as a hemoglobin A1C, which is the average of your blood sugars over three months. You cannot fudge your insulin. You know, you really can't fudge something called C peptide or insulin growth factor. Those two are more specific in our cancer testing world. So those are pieces of information. The other piece of information is, is P sticks, like it's your ketone mm -hmm. sticks, pee on them in the morning after fasting. So no food for 12 to 13 hours, pee on the stick in the morning. If you're metabolically healthy, Healthy, 13 hours, you should see even just some trace ketones, just trace. Okay. Okay. If you're not, well then maybe go 13 and a half hours, 14 hours and eat up a little longer wow. fast until you see trace ketones on there. Great then tip. you know you're yeah. yeah, simple, cheap, $6 yeah. off Amazon, right? Safe for most part. You know, if you, if you're not sure, please talk with your medical yeah. provider. Once you start to see moderate to high ketones, maybe you're starting to practice the concept of intermittent fasting 16 to 18 hours. And notice here what I'm saying, this is just foregoing a food. This isn't mm -hmm. even eating high fat, high protein, whatever. So just know that there are multiple roads to Rome to create a state of metabolic flexibility and a physiologic state of ketosis. There is a way to do it through a ketogenic diet or there's a way to do it from keto exogenous ketones or pharmaceuticals or fasting or various forms of fasting. Okay. There's a lot of different ways to do it, but I like to start people simply by a little bit of caloric restriction, because that's also where the longevity researchers say yes. we get our biggest buck, right? Wow. That, and that is, More. I love that because everyone can add that. That's like an easy ad. She's not Me. saying give up anything yet. She's just yeah, saying exactly. add this. <laughs> exactly. And in fact, that's a really good, there's a great study that came out MD Anderson a few years ago, showing that women who'd had breast breast cancer. They did a huge study. Women who had breast cancer who fasted 13 hours a day. They didn't, they could have been eating Twinkies all right. day long. Fasted all that time, had a 70% less recurrence Whoa. rate than those who ate ad libum. Meaning and you know, 13 hours is easy. That's like, you can have your dinner at seven and not eat again yeah. until I, like, that's not a hard thing. This is exactly. not like but I get, like, I get, I get when you want yeah. all your food in just four hours, but like, totally. that's not hard what exactly. you're talking about. And the crazy thing is you'd be shocked at how hard that actually is for many people. Really? Okay. Okay. Uh, I would say in my, in my practice, I'd say 80% of people struggle with that because they want to eat earlier. They want to eat later. What comes You're like, they, like, but I, I, I have to have, I have to have a snack before I go to bed. I get up and I'm hungry in the middle of the night. I have to eat the second I pop out of bed in the morning. I get hangry. I get shaky. Mm. I get anxious. Those are signs of metabolic instability. Those are signs that say, you got to work harder to yes. get to that point. And so that segues into what Natalie was talking about, about, well, what about fruit and what about sweet potatoes and what about legumes and da well, until you are back to being metabolically flexible and able to move in and out of that dual engine, you know, burning of fat or sugar, you are going to have to push a little harder mm -hmm. to achieve metabolic flexibility. And then you have to be a living laboratory to see how it works in you or yeah. not. It's not going to be the same across the board. So there are reasons for that. It could be like, how sick have you been for how long pharmaceuticals can make these problems happen, certain medical conditions, but a big one is our epigenetics. So certain yeah. SNPs, single nucleotide polymorphism. So in my household, I can eat a pint of, of raspberries at this point. It will do nothing to my sugars. Sure. My husband will eat three and his insulin. It's it just, See, that's amazing. Up. Yeah. And if you have the genetic lottery, like me, like APOA and MTHFR and all the things, 100%. you are my, you and my husband must be related. Yeah. yeah I can't have, and I was a huge fruit fan, like a huge fruit fan. And now I'm like, I really, I, I can have like, I, and it's so interesting. It's so different for everybody. Like I can have tangerines. I can have, there's a few things I can have and definitely some, I cannot anymore. Like pineapple, forget it. 
right. anymore. And you were like, that's exactly. So that's the thing is this is the beauty. Once you achieve that a little bit of ketosis on your, on your, um, urine, and this is an important thing for your mm-hmm. listeners to listen. Also, when people say, well, I always check my urine and my ketones are always good. And I don't understand why I'm still not losing weight or I don't know. Well, the crazy thing is once you actually become fat adapted, once you actually become, start to burn fat as fuel instead of carbohydrates, you should not be seeing ketones in your urine anymore. Oh, okay. Yeah. That always trips people out. Yeah. And then you have to graduate to a ketone blood monitor. Okay. So what is that? Is that different than a glucose monitor? What is, is that? Well, you can get to, there's one, there's a company that's cheaper than what's on the market. Um, and, and I don't, I don't get okay. any facts or anything from this, but keto mojo is the group keto mojo. They have very cheap, both blood and blood glucose and blood ketone strips. And it's just a little simple finger stick. They're actually very pain-free. I'm, I'm shocked at yeah. how good their device, their, uh, uh, little sticker is it's actually really easy. And then you can start to see for yourself. Oh yeah. I'm showing trace ketones now. So basically nutritional ketosis is being between 0.5 to Mm -hmm. two, and then you start to get into therapeutic ketosis above two on your blood ketones for somebody like you, Natalie, who's just like, I'm just about, um, you know, like I want to age well, I want to utilize the implications of what ketones can do for the rest of my body. They lower inflammation. They start sharpen your brain. Mm-hmm. They, you know, help that, that middle-aged spread. They do all the different, like there's so many things sure. that are really good just in general, but in the cancer world, they pull all the levers of the hallmarks of cancer. So that's an important little side note, but with that, you probably only need to be in and out of ketosis somewhere between 0.5 and two on your blood. Okay. Ketone. Right. Good to and know. That you can cycle it. You can cycle it. If you're, if you are a menstruating woman, there are certain times that you probably don't want to be in deep ketosis or trying to fast or being ketosis the week before your period. That doesn't make, unless you're, unless no, you're that doesn't work unless you want to kill everybody in your world. <laughs> so just, sorry. I can't <laughs> like they're all fearing for their lives. But if you're, if you're dealing with certain cancers or certain epileptic yeah. issues, talk to your physician about how to navigate that. Okay. Story. But if you're a general person, you know, doing this for health implications or long-term survivorship post-treatment or prevention of cancer, then you might want to do your ketones around your cycle. So my Mm -hmm. colleague, dear friend, brilliant, um, women health expert, Dr. Mindy Peltz. Yes. I've I've interviewed her on here. I heard her. Well, her new book fast, like a girl is so freaking fantastic Mm -hmm. because she goes into how we actually fast and navigate this territory of metabolic flexibility with regards to our cycles, because women do have to do this differently than men. We're that not, makes total we're, not sense. we're not small men, right? Where bodies no. are, are, are wired differently. So her book is great. If you're someone not dealing with cancer, go and read that. That will really inspire you. So, to, yeah. so you do, if I'm hearing you correctly, it's, it, this is not like an all or nothing situation. You don't have to be an A plus student. So if you're keto, some of the times, if you're like working towards it, it doesn't have to be perfection. That's still going to help. Am I hearing that? Correct. hundred percent. And again, okay. I want to put the caveat of depending on your medical condition. So Got it. there are certain cancer types that I would not cycle keto. Um, okay. and there are certain places where being in a state of therapeutic ketosis is really critical through different facets of the treatment. Mm. That's where a colleague who's been trained in this arena is really important. Don't go that alone. Okay? But if you're listening and you're not navigating cancer right now, and you're like me, where you had some tests off right. or something, it's okay to do be 100%. like a B minus student to start. Even a C <laughs> minus student okay. can get you big leaps forward. I will say doing keto ish, because I say I'm keto ish. <laughs> I, my A1C went from pre-diabetic, which was 5.8 to 4.3. Oh my gosh, girl. So first yeah. of all, 5.8, I'm going to totally freak out your listeners right okay. now. In my world, remember labs are based on the average of the population. Exactly. So a 5.8 in my world mm-hmm. is already very diabetic. Really? Well, that's how, I mean, I, I listen, I sounded the alarms like that. I went, I went like strict when that yeah. happened. Right. So 4.3 is probably pre to you. 4.3 is gorgeous. So if somebody okay. dealing with cancer or try, or if they have a strong family predisposition to metabolic disorders, you know, it sounds like you did, did here. Yes. We want you under five. Yeah. You nailed I it. am. Yes. But, but I did it doing keto ish everybody. So yeah. you can do it. And it took like four weeks. So keto ish. <laughs> I love, and I love that you show people, like I tell people, if I have somebody coming in with a, with an A1C of five point, so to my cutoff is five point. If you hit 5.6, you're already into diabetes. Yes. Still. Yes. There's no such thing. We, we joke in my world, like there's no such thing as pre-diabetic. It's like being, pre, it's like being sort of pregnant. Yeah. Okay? You, no you either are, <laughs> you are or you aren't, and it's yes. not going to go away on its own. 
right? It's going to keep. Yes. And traditional doctors would have also, any endocrinologist would say, go to metformin. So that's why I like, love what you teach because like, I didn't use metformin. This is just, I didn't use a Zomni pack or whatever that thing is. Everyone's saying, I didn't use any of that. I just changed what I was eating. I dialed it in another notch. I added in the fasting and I added in keto ish. So, okay. How do you do keto without messing up your lipids? Because, um, Especially mm-hmm. if you have like the freaky genes, like APOA like, or whatever, right. like I do. So how do, how do people do that? Well, again, I would be looking at your SNPs. If you had a family history or suddenly your lipid profile comes back and it's like, Whoa, now you're like 400 on your overall cholesterol. First of all, that is, so just to remember folks who are back in my era, um, when I graduated medical school in 2000, it, the cutoff for, for well, actually up until 1996, before statins hit the market, the cutoff for overall cholesterol was 399. Okay. The cutoff for triglycerides was 399. The cutoff for LDL was 399. We didn't even know about HDL. Yeah. Over the years, they've chopped that back down. Oh, you need to be under 350. Oh, you need to be under 300. Oh, under 250. Oh, under 200. Oh, under 175. One, just so you guys know, once you get under 175 on your overall cholesterol, you are now at risk for all mortality. Whoa. Whoa. Okay. That's a mic drop. Okay. Yep. No one's heard so, that. Yeah. Yeah. So it's like you're demyelinating your brain, your nervous system. You are absolutely killing your liver. The lipids by or lipid dr- drugs like statin drugs cause metabolic syndrome. So Interesting. Like, okay. So it's awful. Like you don't want that. You stop making hormones. Cholesterol is the mother hormone. Yes. And it's, it protects you. It's designed to protect you. you right. So weird. what is, what is your red flag cholesterol? So like, what so is, I where want, do want people to get started? Yeah. I, so I don't even care about overall cholesterol unless it's like, if, if it's like, if it's too low, I'm more worried about it being okay. too low than too high. What I care about is a, a triglyceride under 90 mm-hmm. yep. and an HDL over 70. The okay. rest of it is basically, like you said, sort of genetic variability. And I will get those clues in other testing. So if somebody okay. has high cholesterol, I'm like, first of all, are you hypothyroid? Second of all, are you on hormone replacement therapy, any birth control, IVF, it's steroids. Those will also jack up your cholesterol. And then for the other thing is like, then what's going on with your kidney function? you'll notice that it's far down on the totem pole before I start questioning their, um, their cardiovascular health. Okay. And that's easily tested with a homocysteine and a C-reactive protein and a galactin three. If those are all within normal range, you are not going to die of a heart attack. All right. And then no one died of hypothyroidism. That's good to know. And I, <laughs> I, I love that you just shared that. Okay. Because you just mentioned it, I got to go there because I am, and I'm very public about it. I'm a fan of bioidentical hormones and they changed my life. So you're about to scare me right now. <laughs> but, so I, this is one of those things I'm reading her book. I'm like, no, 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 no. Don't go there. Um, okay. So, so I am on a very low dose of bioidentical hormones because I was having hot flashes and I was about to kill someone there was, no, I just could not deal any longer. So I, I did, I caved into that. Help me understand the other side. Cause I've had a lot of guests on talking Absolutely. about difference between synthetic and bioidentical. Yeah. Do you have ranges? Do you think it's bad for everybody? And talk yeah. to us about that. Okay. So I was in private practice for 17 years before I focused in on oncology. I literally needed bioidentical hormones five times in my whole entire practice. I had a practice of 2,500 patients, women of every, from PMS to fertility, to menopause, to perimenopause, to all the things. Because what I learned in that time and what my mentors and teachers taught me was that our symptoms are not hormone deficiency, they're hormone imbalances. Okay. And we're all, and what we've learned since then is we're also wired in particular ways of the way we metabolize our hormones. And now thanks to all the lovely um, endocrine disruptors in the world around us, it's more confusing to our chemistry than ever before. So that's one caveat. Okay. The other thing, if you have brought Mindy on, you might've talked about her menopause reset. Yes. Book. And this is where I fell in love with Mindy because every single person, there's a lot of books out there. That I'm like, I really love it until they start to push the hormones. And then yeah. I'm like, uh, cause in my world, you guys remember my world is through the filter of cancer. Yes. Estrogen is a cancer cell proliferator. Period. So let me ask you this before you keep period. going on that. This, period, is, period, period. this is my yeah. big question. Yeah. Cause I've heard that. And yeah. then my question is then why doesn't every pregnant woman have cancer? Cause they're exactly. releasing tons of estrogen. So help me with that. Because endogenous application, so what your own body makes is not the problem. Mm. It's how it's metabolized or how it gets jammed up or convoluted because of other exogenous information, too much stress, too many carbs, you know, too many toxins in the environment. That's where what nature intended goes awry. Okay. 
Okay. So that's, a, I love that that point got brought up because that's very important. Mm -hmm. So here's the next layer we have since, because when I was in medical school, I too was trained. I came, I was like the baby boomer of the, um, uh, bioidentical hormone replacement. World. Yeah. But let me really clarify something right now. And this drives me knuck and futz from all my colleagues <laughs> who tell women that bioidentical hormones are natural. They are not natural. Bioidentical simply means that they mimic your own hormones so well that they're called bioidentical. They're still, they're still synthetic. They're still outside of you. They're still exogenous. Nothing about them is natural. In fact, what we do know is they bind to the receptor site much more firmly than our own endogenous. So they vie for and sort of bully their way into the receptor site. So they like fill up the garage with a lot of stuff, which then we also know it's very, and this is, no, I'm not making this up. Sure. Look at all the research about when you have filled up the garage with your exogenous hormones, you also then no longer properly process your thyroid hormone. Mm. And when the thyroid hormone goes off whack, then your adrenals are affected. And when the adrenal, like it just, you see, it's like a whack-a-mole game. So okay. people may have this moment of like, oh my God, I feel so much better, but maybe it's just a temporary bandage is what I offer. So to you're people. saying, so bioidentical, we have to be careful because just cause you're fixing a symptom, just like you would say with a pharmaceutical, like you're fixing Absolutely. a symptom, you could be creating another issue that affects your thyroid or your adrenal. So okay. what is your, do you suggest that people do like maca? It's like, what, what is your suggestion? They do you focus on balancing your hormones and because it is real, like you're losing yeah. estrogen as you get older, yeah. you're losing testosterone. Like, what do you recommend? Well, you're not losing, you're, you're, you're not losing, you're shifting, you're handing the baton to other organs and other tissues of the body. Right. But we don't want to hand the baton. We want to like feel good and look. Right. And, but you know, I mean, and in the cancer world, the longer you're exposed to estrogen, the higher risk of all cancer types period. Okay. So I started bleeding at nine years old. Ooh, I started wow. my menstruation at nine a decade later, I was dying of ovarian cancer. The longer a woman is exposed to her. So the longer menarche to menopause, that's, okay. all, that's well, that's well associated. Now remember cancer used to be a, a condition of the elderly, but now we're seeing, I mean, I, yes. I, 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 I've consulted on four cases of 10 year olds, people younger than 10 years old with wow. ovarian cancer for crying wow. out loud. Something's changed and no one's asking the why. So the next thing we have to look at with folks today that we didn't know all those years ago was why would hormone replacement therapy be dangerous for one person, maybe not as dangerous for another. And that's when we started looking at the epigenetics all over again. So if you are a woman that has CYP1B1, mm -hmm. calm T and any vitamin D snips and any glutathione snips, you have what's considered, and there's actually lots of good researchers mm -hmm. who publish these in different places, um, that if that can, combination means that you basically do not properly metabolize your endogenous hormones, which puts you at higher risk. And you definitely don't metabolize exogenous hormones very Got well. It. So you okay. store it in all the wrong places at all the wrong times. All right. Okay. If so, someone is on all of this, yeah. like me, and they yeah. want to, they're like, okay, I, I need to pay attention. Do you advise they just completely stop or they wean down? I, well, that's the thing is I want to look at your SNPs. I want to understand what makes you tick. I want to look at your hormone metabolites through something like Dutch or Meridian mm -hmm. Valley, like urine, um, dried urine testing or um, full urine, like 24 hour urine. I want to look at how your body is utilizing this. Okay. That's very important because it's going to differ from person to person. I want to understand what your symptoms were that led you to get on those for how long What was the duration. What was going on in your life? Was this pre keto? Was this pre whatever? So when I start to evaluate that most of the time, I find that women in their transition in, in perimenopause window, it's because we end up with too much cortisol, too much insulin and not enough oxytocin. That's what, when, that's what Mindy talks about in her book. So all women are being trained to think that their sexuality, their sensuality, and their connection to another is based on their estrogen, their testosterone levels. I will tell you right here and right now, that is not where it is. Okay. If you're, if someone's like, I have low libido, my first question is not what's your hormones. It's what's going on with you and your partner. Oh yeah. Okay. That makes okay. sense. Um, most, most of the time that's where the hangup is. Okay. Women are by nature connectors. Oxytocin is what makes us connect. What's makes us orgasm. What makes us relax. What makes us take a dump. What makes us put babies out our bodies. What makes us have milk come out of our bodies. Like it is important when you're under high cortisol, there is no oxytocin. Okay. All right. So, I'm some of this is landing on me. Some of this, I love I'm, not, it. I'm not like fully committed to yeah, that's right. that's, <laughs> but, well, but it's exactly. landing. I'm listening. Well, and if you do, so if you do, because majority yeah. of my work with women were women coming in saying, I have cancer. I have to stop these things. Sure. Right? 
So, um, or women saying my mom had cancer or now I want to get off these things or yeah. whatever. So I had to help navigate that. So through the SNPs, through the testing of their hormones to see where they are on the medication, finding out a good history is important. And then we can do things like running a, t a, a full thyroid panel. We can look at your T3 uptake, which is what I call poor man's hormone testing. Yep. Right? If it's above 30, that sh shows me more androgen dominance, metabolic syndrome dominance. If it's below 30, that shows me more estrogen dominance. That's my cheap fix. If someone yeah. can't afford a couple hundred bucks for those other tests, then we start to play with, okay, what's really going on. What I found personally, if I get people on low carb diets, mm -hmm. so carbohydrate restriction, whether that's putting them into ketosis or not, if I help them get into stress mitigation and I help them increase their oxytocin levels, guess what? Hot flashes go away. Guess yeah. what? Libido comes back. Guess what skin? It look, I mean, look at how great you look after an orgasm for crying out loud. I mean, that is like, <laughs> you know, that is that, that flush. The other thing is that what women are misunderstanding about their hot flashes is most of them are dealing with a histamine intolerance. And so I play with histamine um, reduction and uh, elimination in the process of their being a transition. I also help women know that when you start to track when their hot flashes are at their worst, mm -hmm. a lot of them will tell me they just got pissed off at work and they flared or I had coffee. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. or alcohol, or I had a fight with my spouse or a certain time of day. Those are clues to what's going on in our biochemistry, usually around cortisol yet again. Mm -hmm. um, and so the, or blood sugar. So those are the pieces, cortisol, blood sugar, histamine um, are the big drivers of that. So we start to work with that the terrain, and then suddenly everything starts to fall back into place. So wow. now we have juiciness and connection and, and stronger, you know, uh, orgasm and better sleep and less heat, uh, trapped in the body. And suddenly mm -hmm. folks are happy because what happens when we move into perimenopause, we hand that baton to our adrenals. Who do you know, living on the planet today has normal functioning adrenals. Yeah, exactly. And so that's where we're treating the wrong, we're barking up the wrong tree. We okay. need to be supporting our adrenals. We need to be supporting our stress. We need to be supporting our metabolic health and that will right the ship. So good. Yeah. yeah. You got me thinking about a lot now. So, well, so I'll, I'll have perfect. to report back. And I do like when I have women who say, I don't have cancer. I don't have a family history of cancer. I've done all my workups. I'm thinking I'm pretty good. I'm on this for a period of time. I remind women and get on it and get off it. If it's a crutch, if it's a bridge, yeah. you walk across to make the transition better. But I cannot even tell you what a horrible, sad thing it is for me to see people like 72 years old, still on their hormones. And now they're wondering yeah. why they're dying of uterine cancer. I think that whatever. it's just so confusing. I, and I'll speak right. for myself. Like I, I've had so many guests on here. It's just so confusing yeah. the different takes on it. Cause we hear so many different things, right? Let you hear you this. how many of those guests who talk about the best of hormones that replace in therapy are experts in oncology. None. You're right. Right. So when, so there was a nurse practitioner in my community. I hope she listens to this later. Sure. Literally we had like a back and forth fight for about two decades. Okay. And she would literally say to my patients, I will stay on my HRT and I will prescribe HRT until I either have a heart attack or get cancer. Sadly, door number two was opened. For wow. Her. It changed her life. Now she gives my book to everybody. She talks about yeah. the story. She was the person who brought bioidentical hormones to my small town. Interesting. Right? She had to unfortunately walk through that doorway herself. Now that she understands it from the other side and from another perspective, that's the difference. My colleagues who are out there very happy and promotional about this. I want them to start to say, okay, there literally is enough evidence. And I'm telling this to protect my colleagues. Sure. There is enough evidence out there today. If the patient runs their epigenetics and they end up with cancer, thanks to your bioidentical hormone prescription, they can sue your ever love in life. Wow. Right? Period. That's okay. how much evidence there is. I get fired up on this because I'm the one who's treating those people. Yes. I'm the one who's seen those people. I'm the one who's dealing with the devastation of, I did everything right. Yes. And we look at it and go, you did everything right, but let's look at your SNPs and let me show you, you were destined to have cancer in this combination. And so, and that's not going to help with it, that. Okay. Great. Well, I can't, I can't promise I'm giving it all up, but I'm promising right. I'm going to listen promise and I'm going to take on, and I'm not going to up the levels. I'll tell you that right now. Well, not going I promise up. me you'll just do a deeper dive in who yeah. you are and what you are and, and, and work with someone who can help you start to tease out like, well, what part is do I need? Can I do less of this? Can I work myself through it and make the transition to a point where 
I don't sure. even need to lean on that anymore. That makes sense. It's a perfect, I mean, talk about a learning opportunity of just like understanding your body at its best and where it brought you that much needed oxygen mask. Maybe you've got the resources now to do it more on your Well, own. and I think it's kind of like, I mean, I think back to being, most people listening did this too, uh, in my twenties or from like the time I was 16 on being on synthetic birth control pills for 100%. 20 years, you know, thinking that was like fine and going, oh my gosh. And yeah. Now, yeah. you know, so glad I'm not now, but so it's, I think we just, we change things as we learn. And, and that's just it. Like, you know, that's the thing. Like I was a big person who was a big pusher of iodine. That was a really big part of my practice for years until I learned more. And after I literally poisoned multiple patients oh, and wow. realized I've overdone this, I had to learn. I'd go back to my patients say, I didn't know what I didn't know, but now that I know I have to do something different, here's the information, here's the data, do with it what you will. My patients appreciated that in me. They would say, I love that you keep learning and changing with this. It's called the art or practice of medicine for a reason. Yes. It's not static. So when we learn new data to, to compel us, we shift with that data. And so the same thing, like selenium, I was like, in my book, I even talk about take your Brazil nuts. I yes. have learned that that's actually one of the most toxic ways to get in your selenium. It is. And cancering patients, the form that we used, used to recommend called selenomethionine is actually something we probably should avoid as well. So okay. if we have a patient needing selenium. The Brazilian nuts go away now. Okay. I, I didn't I know. know this. Which I bought them after the, your book. Right. Right. And same here. It's like, that's the one thing I'm like, ah, okay. Take that out of the book, right? so good. But we same can sell walnuts. Like, <laughs> yeah, there you go. Exactly. Go back to those things. And then the other thing, like if you have true, like low T3 elevated thyroid antibodies, mm -hmm. true low selenium on your blood testing, then there's safe forms, like from a form called sodium selenite. And even okay. sodium selenite is even at a prescription dose in treatments of many cancers. It's really good for uh, TP53 gene mutations, et cetera. So there's a time and a place, but you just have to vary it. So it's like, we had some of the information, but not all of it. Yes. Um, fear that we're probably in a similar boat with, with HRT, um, you know, bio HRT, because we all learned that about conventional HRT and we're like, yes. throw that out. But we're like, it's like going BPA free in your plastic, right? That's right. Really the shift we made. So it's going to come to this time. And when you look at the documentation that we're collecting in our database, because we're collecting at, we've got a database we're building out that's collecting all these data points. It's really easy for us to see like this isn't information I'm making up. I'm just reading to you the patterns, the data that's coming into me. I'm looking at the information and I'm looking at how we can change the expression of things along the way. So we, we learn in real time together. We move in this stream together. And I suspect Natalie that your reaction response to the, to the hormones is probably in some ways safer than others because you are doing all the other things. Mm -hmm. You are you have me questioning, just listening to you and have me questioning, like all the things that came up with my blood sugar, all those things came up after starting hormones. So now I'm, I'm questioning. So, yeah. so I really am listening to you. I do have a couple, I, I could talk to you for hours, but I'm going to, I'm going to start <laughs> winding it down. Cause I have so many Thank questions you. for you, but I want to ask, there's something I had really important. I wanted to ask you about. So I want to make sure I get that in what? you in the book talked about mammograms. Oh, and yeah. your take on that. And obviously we get pushed to do a mammogram by conventional yeah. doctors continually. Can you share about that in your own words about mammograms? First of all, I'm kind of laughing. I, I feel like there's going to be so many rotten tomatoes being thrown at me from this. No, I, I controversial love it. <laughs> this is not so, we need to hear the other, this is the do. problem. We, we can't just learn one side and not, I think everyone needs to be their own health advocate. You have to hear the information and learn both things. Yes. And then you make the best decision for you. That's what I think. I love it. So it's interesting when you think about this. So other parts of the world are less enamored with mammograms as we are here in the United States. One of my, uh, a, a woman I know from our field, um, her name is Susan Wadia Ells. I don't know if you've ever had her on. She wrote a book called Busting Breast Cancer, and she has a whole section around sort of the controversy around mammograms. There's actually multiple big, big, big studies on the implications of mammograms, either one being ineffective or two actually having some potential to cause cancer. So okay. let's just, without even going into those, let's just talk about the reality. Let's talk about the data, right? 70% yes. of women have either augmented breasts, meaning that they maybe have had it poked with for a biopsy or a lumpectomy, or maybe um, breast reduction or implants or, or toxic yeah. implants like me. So I, that's so another thing I got working on. <laughs> there you go. But like all the things, right? Like, so there's yeah. like, there's like, they've had been messed with in some way. So there's that. Then there's the group of women who have small breast tissue. And then there's the group of women that have dense breast tissue. Basically that's 70% of all boobs on the planet should not be mammogrammed. Okay. What happens is mammograms then do one of two things. They either completely miss it. So they miss diagnose mm -hmm. or they miss the diagnosis. 
Okay. So they either say, oh, you have cancer because something looks suspicious here when it's just other things going on and it scares the crap and causes all kinds of trauma, or they miss it altogether, which happens a lot. And especially the younger you are, here's, here's the caveat. This is literally off the Mayo website. Cause I just had this conversation this morning. You ready for this? Okay. Youth. So premenopausal dense breasts. So already knowing okay. your boobs are a little bit denser and less floppy, right? Uh-huh. Being on hormone replacement therapy. Wow. Changes your breast density. Okay. Okay. Um, and uh, of course the augmented breasts, those are patients that are already considered it, even in Mayo says these folks, they still of course push the mammogram, but they're like, but you should also get an ultrasound and yes. really have a good examination. So what's really cool is we've got two technologies that are available to us today that do not cause any smashing of the tissue, which you do not want to snap. This is very vulnerable tissue. Yes. It's going to get lymphatic with vasculature. Um, you know, it's, it's glands. There's so much happening here. Do you really want to smash that and then radiate that? Does that, no, that may, it sounds like you're adding a problem to it. That's definitely. Different. And that's where I get concerned. And so there are technologies now available to us that are sadly not yet covered by insurance, but it's like I, thermography um, like that. Well, thermography is actually pretty limited because okay. it's not sensitive and specific enough. It's another additional tool. And it's very interesting. And it shows you thermal changes in areas of inflammation and blood pooling very powerful tool, but you cannot lean on it because it does not give you something measurable, quantifiable to follow or to repeat. But there is a, a particular ultrasound device called Sonocina, S-O-N-O-C-I-N-E, which is a high sensitivity, high specificity ultrasound. They've got those around the country. Unfortunately, there's a few places that do it, but then they say you have to have a mammogram and do this. I'm like, I go to the ones that do not require you to have a mammogram. Okay. Okay. Um, if you happen to fall in those categories, we just talked about, yes. If you got the floppy boobs and you're big and like, and if you feel like you, you want to just do your great. thing. Yeah. Right. Um, but, and then the other one is a new updated version of a, of a, um, MRI without the contrast dye. So it doesn't is that have a breast a- MRI that people do. Okay. No, because the breast oh, no. MRI, which is the gold standard and standard of care. Yeah. If you already have a breast cancer diagnosis, please don't ever go back to using a mammogram ever again. You are now only to use ultrasound pre nuvo, which is this non contrast dye MRI or a standard breast MRI, because at that point you do not want to keep smashing. You do not want to keep throwing sticks at mm-hmm. sleeping tigers, right? No. With a mammogram. So the pre nuvo is Dr. Arvala out of Vancouver, BC. He is a radiation oncologist. Who's also a chemical engineer, PhD in chemical engineering. He realized he could build a better MRI. He was on Dr. Peter Atia's um, podcast in July, 2019. I happened to hear it to the point of sent thousands of patients his way ever since. And now he's got these centers opening up all over the United States, all over North America, soon to be in the UK. What it, what it's doing is it's taking an even more sensitive and specific picture than the typical MRI without the contrast dye. And it's even in a back-to-back comparison with PET scans without that contrast dye, as well as the radiation. So this is where medicine is going that you do not have to smash and irradiate and put contrast dye into your body to get good imaging. So So that's where we're headed. And I get really excited. There's a really good book called um, more than meets the MRI, which talks about the dangers of contrast dye. I personally am. I'm a gadolinium poisoned person on this planet. Wow. My personal history of MRIs that I was using at that time, I can't use those okay. you know, in this. And then another thing is a lot of people are worried about BRCA genes, the BRCA one or two, this type of um, genetic predispositions to cancers are actually very highly sensitive, highly vulnerable to radiation. These cancers are about poor DNA repair of our healthy cells right? So radiation is the biggest way to damage your DNA. And so we're pushing these women to go and have twice a year mammograms. I will have job security because of that recommendation sucks. So it's like those patients, my BRCA, ATM, Lynch, GATA3, MLH1, MSH2 patients, any check two patients. I am saying, don't do the mammos. Please do the sonocenas and the pre And I canceled mine after I read that in your book. So I was like, okay, I get it. I get it to look right without causing harm. And the bummer is it's someday we're we're building this nonprofit. Someday we'll be able to have grants to help women who do not have the means to pay for those technologies. And hopefully the, the, the demand will be at a point where those costs get driven down. So we can all afford to do those instead of harmful imaging opportunities. Yeah. 
You are so knowledgeable. I love interviewing. I could literally talk to you for hours, but I'm going to tell, we, we barely scratched the surface on what she <laughs> teaches everyone. You have to go get her book, the metabolic approach to cancer. Literally. Yeah. She, we didn't even talk about so much that's in the book about nutrition and just what's in our environment. And like, she gives really easy, simple things that we can add into our lives that we could change. Like, it's not about an all or nothing. I mean, when I read it, I was, I remember the first time I was reading it, I'm on the airplane with my husband. I'm tapping him every two seconds. Like, look, we got to do this. Look, we got to do this. It's like, stop. This poor guy's but, like, I hate her. <laughs> but, but it, really I started just applying. I'm not perfect at it, but I started applying little things and I've seen a lot of changes from that. So I highly recommend her book. Thank you so much for today. Thank you so much for sharing with my audience here. Uh, and everyone, please go, where can people find you? Where do you want them to follow you? I love, well, Natalie, thank you so much for this opportunity. I really appreciate all that you're doing for, for folks in the world. This is great, but come look for me. Probably the easiest place it's going to have everything is mtih.org, which stands for Metabolic Terrain Institute of Health. Dot org. And that will also link you back into drnasha.com. And it'll talk about the books I've written and the pot millions of podcasts and different things. You can come and free materials to go in lots of rabbit holes, but um, definitely okay. follow us there. And Natalie, thanks again for this incredible opportunity. Thank you so much.